open your Bibles to Colossians. We are actually going to finish up one small part of the core value of prayer before we move on to the next core value. If you um, missed last week and you're just now joining us this week, we are spending the next six to eight weeks. It always is dependent on how much material we get through to really solidly get through a core value. But the point of the next six to eight weeks is for us to really keen in on our core values as a church. What does it mean to truly embrace what the Christian life should be all about and how do we as a church begin to live those things out? And so we're really focusing in on the core. How do we get strength from the core? And we've used the metaphor, we've used the illustration that we ourselves, the way God designed us, if we do not have a strong core, then it's going to not go well if we try to engage in other physical activities. That the core is very essential for who we are physically, and the same is true spiritually. We need to have a real understanding of what it means to join God in His missional activity locally and globally by understanding the core values of the church and specifically the core values of Second Mile. So last week we spent a long time talking through prayer, but I didn't get to one thing, so I want to get to that one thing this evening. I ended with this statement, and the statement that I ended with was this, there is never, there is a never ceasing temptation always alluring within our culture. It is a t temptation to substitute the source of our strength. As you begin to think through that statement, that quote, that we live in a hostile environment. And the only way to truly live differently than the culture around us is to cling to the Word of God and to communicate in a conversation with God. One of the things that I think you heard Esther talk about in the video is that as we lean into what God is doing through a conversation with Him, He begins to put peace in our life. The way Esther stated it was that I feel less stressed. Now some of you may say, well yeah, but she's 16. I mean, how much stress can a 16 year old have? But the fact of the matter is, if you lean in to a conversation with God, I guarantee you will feel less stress. Because God brings comfort and rest and security. It may not be comfortable, but He will bring security to your life as you lean into conversation. And so as culture begins to become hostile, this is the question that we often ask. How do I know the will of God? And we don't end there. What we say in that statement is, how do we know the will of God, and this is what we add onto it, in my life. How do we know the will of God in my life? There's this movement that we find in our own desire to just understand God and really understand that we're doing the right thing, that we're always asking the question, God, what's your will, but we don't stop there. God, what's your will in my life? And I think as we move towards prayer, we need to change the way we ask that question. And I think, in fact, we need to stop mid-sentence and just stop with, God, what is your will? I think we're so inundated with me, me, me that we forget to just look at what does the word of God say? I'm going to use a few examples. This is not pointing out, pointing fingers to anyone. This is not bringing up your lives. This is just simple examples that we can go through. That as you grow up and as you begin to engage in culture and as you begin to say, God, what should I do in the context of life, in the context of college living, in the context of relationships? You have all kinds of options thrown at you night and day. And you have to begin to understand, God, what is your will? And so you may be asking the questions, God, what is your will? Should I go to this party? Should I drink this alcoholic beverage? Should I date this person? And those questions in many cases become irrelevant. And the reason they become irrelevant is simply this. The Bible already covers it. So if you want the answers to those questions, read your Bible. 
open its pages and hear what God has to say about dating relationships. Hear what God has to say about being a worthy man and a worthy woman. We spent a lot of time in the book of Ruth. What does it look like to lead in relationships? What does it look like to engage your heart in a relationship that there is equality in the foundation of Christ? And so as you engage in those kinds of relationships, if you are starting to date and this person may not have the same spiritual fervor as you, the answer is not, God, should I date this person or not? He's already given you the answer. The answer is no. The same is true for drinking. The same is true for this. Well, how many is too many? That question is irrelevant. Scripture tells us how many is too many. And so as you begin to involve yourself in prayer, when you begin to ask the question, God, what is your will? Stop there. And allow scripture to impact your life in such a way that your actions begin to change. You see, it's not a special direction. In fact, asking for a special direction is often a distraction for an individual's life. Because now you're no longer focused on the will of God, you're focused on how, long, how close can I get to the line without sinning. I think if we move towards prayer with a pure heart, with a heart to know and understand the will of God, we're going to step much further from that line of sin than if we simply say, how close can I get What's your will for my life? Other parts of this is a knowledge of his will. It is a deep and abiding understanding of the revelation of Jesus and all that he means for the universe as well as your current communal environment. Here's a couple of verses. Proverbs chapter 9 verse 10 says this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Now you've heard me say this. If you really want to know what God's activity is globally, what God's activity is locally, what, God act, what God's activity is personally in your life, then draw close to Him. What does Proverbs say? It says, wisdom that comes from God. And we gain that wisdom that comes from God by fearing God. We just came out of a year long in Exodus. And as we came out of that year long in Exodus, what did we learn about the power and the magnificence of God? He is a great and mighty and good and powerful and intentional and personal God. If we want to know His will, we get to know his wisdom through the fear of the Lord, and we get to know his wisdom through the knowledge of the Holy Spirit. How often do you feel the Holy Spirit's elbow in your gut? You say the gut check, right? How often do you feel the Holy Spirit's gut check? If it's often, then you probably are leaning close to him. If you never feel it, then you probably need to shift the way your life is constructed. And so as we look towards prayer, and we're about to get into the next value, which is truth, a knowledge of the will of God is important because it allows us to build a foundation, a strength from the core that is this foundational principle. If I lean close, I'll begin to understand who God is. Another passage that we're not going to go through tonight, but you can look this up on your own, is Proverbs chapter 2, verses 6 through 22. It's an amazing um, proverb of just leaning close to God. So as we move from there, the question is this. What are your deceitful forms of substitution? And are you praying for God to remove these false forms? Hopes. And we kind of use that question as part of the cultural question that it's always waiting to tempt us and how do we find distractions. And so if you're moving through that set of questions, intensity of prayer is not the point. 
Some of you may say, well, my prayer life, I'm just not as intense. When I get around people and they start to pray, I mean, they just are so intense. They grit their teeth and they start to sweat. It's like they're eating hot food. I don't know what it's like, but that's what it's like. And I'm just not that way when I pray. But I want you to hear this. Intensity is not the point. Rather, it is devotion. If you turn to Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, Listen to these two verses. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ, an account of which I am in prison that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. What does it say? Continue steadfastly. Intensity is not the point. The point is constancy. Habitual, perseverant prayer is our aim. I think that's why when we look at prayer and we watch a video, and we watch a video of a teenager talking about prayer, the reason that that teenager is drawing close to God is the fact that they just consistently do it. It's humbling. It's convicting. It moves us to ask the question in the same way that I'm going to enter into conversation with my wife on a daily basis. Am I going to enter into a conversation with God? And as I enter into a conversation with God, is He going to reveal to me what His will is? Period. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18 says this, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of... Whoa, whoa, what, what? What's the will of God? What's the will of God? Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of, Christ, of God in Christ Jesus for you. As we move from the value of prayer and we begin to work on another section of muscle groups in our core, which is going to be truth, what I want to be imprinted in your heart and imprinted in your mind is meaningful repetition. Is your prayer life meaningful and is it healthily repetitive? I think when you read scripture, you find a people who constantly come into a dialogue with God and they just constantly bring their heart to him. It is a repetitive discipline. We now are going to move to truth. And as we move to truth, we're again going to look at several parts of Colossians to begin to support the foundation of where we find truth. And in order to get there, we're going to again read the core value of truth that we have outlined within the context of Second Mile. So here it is. We believe that the best way to live is to submit our lives to God's truth instead of personal agendas, religious rituals, or cultural trends. We look to the Bible to know the truth of God's redemptive relationship with humanity. We study scripture and listen to the Holy Spirit to live wisely. And we look to Jesus' example of love and sacrifice to live transformed lives and, takes, and take God's truth out into the city we live in. If you'll turn back to chapter 1 and look at verse 15, this is where we're going to get started in verses 15 through 21 as we support the core value of truth in Paul's letter to the Colossians. He is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before 
all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Verse 21. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. As you begin to read verses 15, that next section of Colossians through verses 21 and 22, and then kind of move through that last part of the verse, what you find is this. Jesus is the absolute center of truth. So our foundation, if we're going to drive a stake in the ground, the stake that we are going to drive is on the name and fame and reputation and character and person and godliness of Jesus. Jesus is at the very center of our truth. If we are not a church that all the time talks about Jesus, then we are not a church that's doing what we're supposed to be doing. And so as we begin to strengthen our core spiritually, as we begin to work out our faith in such a way that a world watches us, a world interacts with us, a world is exposed to who we are, they are going to hear the name of Jesus. That we cannot shy away from the fact that he is the absolute sinner. Why is he the absolute sinner? Because it says in verse 15, he is the image of God. If you put your finger there and you'll turn to John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, chapter 1. Some of you know this. It's the famous passage that describes who Jesus is. I just want to read this. I want scripture to penetrate your heart. I want you to hear who Jesus is. In the beginning, chapter 1, verse 1, was the word, speaking of Christ. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Now, isn't this sounding repetitive? Remember, meaningful repetitiveness? Paul is explaining again what John has already explained in the Gospel, that in all things, Jesus is there. Nothing was made without Jesus being there. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. Speaking of John the Baptist, the true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. Jesus, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, who gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Our Christian faith is absolutely contingent on the humanity and the deity and the godliness and the absoluteness of Jesus. And so where is your faith? Does it involve Jesus? I think so many times our faith can involve so many things. It can involve relationships. It can involve social justice. It can involve having the right doctrine. It can involve so many different things. But does your faith involve Christ? Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. Speaking again of Jesus. He is the radiance of the glory of God. And listen to this and the exact imprint of God's nature. And he, speaking of Jesus, upholds the universe by the word of his power. 
After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. You've often heard the leadership of Second Mile talk about that Jesus can be our homeboy because there is a closeness about who Jesus is. That, that is true. Jesus is our friend. Jesus did walk this planet. Jesus at one time was able to be touched. Jesus at one time was able to be observed in his emotion. But don't forget that Jesus, even more than our friend, is our king. He is the same God that we speak of when we say Yahweh in the Old Testament. And so if we are to build our lives on the core value of truth, we must settle once and for all the character and the personhood and the divinity of Jesus. Our entire belief system is Jesus, the Son of God, the perfect manifestation of the invisible God. As you guys know, I'm, I'm enrolled in seminary, and this is just a fun fact that if I allow myself, Lisa could actually be one of my professors in the future. So I'm kind of just excited, scared, I think, more than excited. I don't want to be her first I don't want to be the guy that got to be in her class that she knows, and she's like, yeah, he didn't know, really, but whatever. So I'm currently in seminary, and the class that I'm taking now is, um, it's two different labels that you can put on it, Church History 1 or the Survey of Christianity Part 1. And Part 1 simply means from really the New Testament, so from what, that period of time, so the first to the third century. So the first 300 years of the existence of the church, or you can go a little further and basically go until... Um, the Reformation. So it's that kind of period of history. And so as I have been studying, we went to our first class this week, and it was so awesome just as I began to internalize what was happening among the early church when it came to the false uh, ideas that were trying to erode the truth of Jesus. And if you look at the heresies in the early church, What's interesting about those heresies is they never questioned the reality of Christ. And this is really interesting. The reason they never questioned the reality of Christ is when you look at those first biblical heresies, the agenda was to attack really the gospel, attack that it's Jesus, but there's something else that has to be attached to Jesus because of this. The early church had seen Jesus' power and glory. Even the people that weren't part of the church had saw this group of people that called themselves Christians. And there was two things that were known about these people that called themselves Christians. And those two things were this. One, they were not afraid to die. In fact, there was a joke among the unbelievers of the early church that said this, if you want to find out if they're a Christian, just torture them, because they will never deny Christ. And this is what my professor jokingly and not jokingly said. What if you had that test in your church? You're a Christian? We're going to torture you and find out. Because the true Christians would never deny the character of Christ. That was what was thought. That was the reality of how people placed a significant weight on the truth of Jesus. And the second was this, that people who were gathered together from all nations, especially in the church of Jerusalem, it was very diverse. And you had the Jewish people, and among the Jewish people you had the Hellenistic Jews, and you had the Judaic Jews, and we've heard some of that language a little bit. And then you also had the Gentiles, and you had all of this. It was great diversity. And the second thing that was so common among the early church was not only were they not afraid to die, but they called the most diverse people their friends that they didn't allow their differences to separate the truth of the presence of Jesus in their life. And as you begin to think about your life and your faith, and as you begin to think about how truth comes under attack in our culture, when people begin to speak falsely about our faith, how has times changed? You see, in the early church, they had already seen the power of Christ. They had seen His glory. 
the principles that came into question was how are we going to be saved, not who is the Savior. And so as you begin to wrestle with your faith, please solidify the reality of Jesus. So we move from verse 15 that says Jesus is the absolute center of truth to then verse 16 which says all God's creative work took place in terms of or in reference to Christ. Again, we don't sit here and think about this, but I've had several conversations recently with people who are involved in viewing or gazing the stars. They are building the telescopes. They're involved in the engineering of seeing what the universe is all about. And I don't think you and I have fathomed the reality that verse 16 speaks about in Colossians that says this, the universe happens because Jesus holds it in his hand. He is what sustains the universe. Now again, this isn't magical mumbo jumbo. This isn't the absence of intellect when it comes to the reality of faith. Has God set the universe in motion? Did he speak the words along with Jesus and along with the Holy Spirit and he spoke the world into creation? Absolutely. Does he know physics? Does he know science? Does he know all the things that I definitely do not know? So I'm going to stop there because I don't want to say anything that's not true. Yes. But still at the foundation, if at a moment Jesus decided it would all fall apart. Jesus is the sustainer of life. He is the sustainer of the universe. And when you read verse 16 of chapter 1, you begin to get that clear image. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Without going into an incredible amount of detail, which I like to do, but I'll spare you just this once. The Colossians were exposed to and having to speak against false teaching. Guess what? You're exposed every day to false teaching. It can be major, it can be minor. But our culture constantly is speaking against the truth of Jesus. And what the Colossians were experiencing in their environment was this, that the ultimate spiritual experience had to be found in places in addition to Jesus. So Jesus is good. You've heard that. I like Jesus. But in order to really be fulfilled, why don't you add this to Jesus? Why don't you add this type of relationship? Why don't you add this type of activity? Why don't you add this type of freedom and then involve Jesus in that? That is what Paul is speaking to when he speaks about the centrality of the absolute truth of Jesus. And so for you, I want you to ask this simple question. Where is your experience of faith found. At the end of the day, remember last week I asked this incredibly simple question, what's the point? Why do you do this? Why are you here? Well, I think that moves into this question, where is your experience of faith found? Is it in the emotional energy that you feel when you come into a room and there's a large group of people singing loud and proclaiming the glory of fill in the blank? Do you have the same feeling that when you attend a U of A football game that you do when you attend a radically amazing church service? What is the experience of your faith? Is it emotion? Is the experience of your faith intellect? Do you have to prove it before you believe it? Is the experience of your faith people? And then people let you down, and then you're like, well, wait a second, I thought that's what my faith was about. How do you experience 
your faith. Another question may look like this. How do you find solidarity in your faith? What is unmovable about the fact that you call yourself a child of God? Another way to ask it, who and what provides a reliant guide for your faith? The answer in Colossians, the answer at the core of who we are, what will allow us to speak against the false things that are said about us and about the Bible and about the reality of church history and about philosophy and about all kinds of things, the only thing that will stand up to the false attacks of that is the superiority and the centrality of Jesus. So where is your faith found? In fact, that verse in verse 16 and 17 says, True truth is found in these places. Truth is found in heaven and earth. Truth is found in the visible and in the invisible. Truth is found in thrones and dominions, which is really interesting. And at the same time, it is found in the rulers and authorities. And the reason that truth is found in all of those what seemingly contradict each other places is that despite the contradiction of those things, Christ is supreme. Now this is going to maybe offend you. Maybe. So I'm going to warn you before I do it. In the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter who the next president of the United States is. Why? Because Jesus is our king, not president fill in the blank. The president is not going to save us. Jesus has saved us. Now, hear me. I'm not saying that it's pointless to vote. It's not what I'm saying. But I think we find such conviction in the foundation of who we are, in our culture, in our society, in our whatever, and we lose the centrality of our faith. Jesus is at the center of who we are. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10 say this, making known to us the mystery of his will. There's that will card again. According to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. We move from verse 15 that says Jesus is the absolute center of truth to verse 16 that says all God's creative work took place through Christ to verse 17 that says the universe, and I've already mentioned this, is held together by Jesus. And then we move to verse 18 which says Jesus leads, moves, and gives authority to the church. The world has fallen and continues to show its rebellion. But Jesus, through the truth of the gospel and the voice of the church, speaks boldly of the resurrection. Now, I want you to grasp that again. And I know tonight's a little deep, and yet simplistic, because we're just talking about Jesus. I'm going to read that again, and I'm going to explain it just a little more. The world has fallen and continues to show its rebellion. But Jesus, through the truth of the gospel, which you may need to ask yourself the question, what is the gospel? And the voice of the church speaks boldly of the resurrection. Again, at the core of who we are, there's something about the Christian faith that is different than all other world views. It's not just Jesus, but it is Jesus crucified and resurrected. The gospel is the truth that that event took place. It is the reality that Jesus conquered the grave. It is the magnificent placement of God putting the wrath of sin on his son so that you and I could stand a chance against the anger of God on sin. Jesus living and dying and conquering 
proclaim is the gospel. But who's the voice in 2012? The church. And guess what? The voice in the church in Colossae was also the voice. The church in Philippi, the church in Thessalonica, the church in Greece, the church in Rome, the church that has spread throughout generation and generation and generation becomes the voice of the gospel. And the church in our culture at many times has counted itself a counterfeit for the voice of the glory of God. And so we as his church need to stand firm in the presence of Jesus and proclaim loudly the truth of the gospel which is shown in the truth of the resurrection. Acts chapter 2 verse 36 says this, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Romans chapter 1 verse 4 says this, And I was and was declared to be the Son of God in power, speaking of Jesus, according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Philippians chapter 2 verses 9 through 11 says this, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What's so amazing about that set of verses and specifically ending in Philippians, we've already stated Jesus reigns over creation. There's no argument there. But you see, it's also true that Jesus reigns over every individual. Not just those who have entered into the family of God. Jesus is the authority over all of humanity. And that's where the argument begins to get fuzzy, I think, for some people. You see, the question, as you begin to wrestle with Jesus' reign over every individual, is do those individuals acknowledge his reign? And that is what begins to determine the transformation that takes place in the life of a child of God, which this is where I will close for the evening in asking these questions about the truth that is at the core a value of who we are as followers of Jesus. Do you fully embrace the reign of Christ in your life? Do you fully embrace that Jesus has a plan? Jesus is good. Jesus is taking the initiative. Jesus wants you to be on board with what he is doing. Do you embrace his reign? As you embrace his reign, do you submit to his authority in your life? I think, again, this is the beauty of Jesus. He lets us make mistakes. He lets us make devastating mistakes. He lets us experience the mistakes of others, even when we ourselves didn't make a mistake. It's incredibly sobering. We are often affected by other people's decisions. And yet we're still affected. And yet in the middle of how we are affected, do we still submit to the authority of Christ in our life? And the final question for this evening and for you to ponder this week is this. Does redemption hold its proper place of gratitude in your life? Now again, we just came out of Exodus. So I would hope that you have this very fresh understanding that the people of God were unbelievably grateful for the freedom that they experienced by the presence of Yahweh. 
but for you as we wrestle with the centrality and the supremacy of Jesus as the foundation of the core of who we are as the church, do we experience gratefulness in our redemption? When's the last time through words, through acknowledgement, through just falling on your face and being in awe of the fact that because of God's plan, because of the truth of the gospel, because of Jesus' obedience, obedience to the point of death, even death on the cross, because of Jesus' triumphant victory of the cross and the grave through his resurrection, have you pondered that you do not have to experience the justifiable wrath of God, but get to experience the absolute presence of Christ? For that, we should be grateful. And that gratefulness should explode out of our mouths to tell others how they can experience the truth of Jesus.